Okay, so we're back again to finish up our talk about wood. So we spent two lectures on steel, and now we're spending the second of our two lectures on wood. Concrete will be a little bit different because the biggest concept that we need to understand with concrete is composite action. So I've broken concrete almost into two separate lectures where the first one is all about composite action that isn't just applicable to wood, but a series of other materials as well. And then we'll look at a concrete um, column and beam design. So we really only have three major math-based lectures left. Um, the, over the, net, the last three weeks of the course, we're going to do one lecture that is beam testing, where uh, I will make and then test um, a series of beams that kind of illustrate some of the topics we're going to be talking about. We'll look at wood and steel and concrete, and we'll look, we'll really see what the impact of making something composite has. Um, so that just gives us the opportunity to really tangibly see these things in effect. Um, so we'll try to do it on a day that we have a kid, so Dave and I can do it together. It kind of takes two people to manage the, the whole process. Um, if we can't get a nanny, we'll invite another family over, and there will be an audience of testing beams. Um, the other two possible, or the last two lectures, one will be um, examples of things. Um, so if there's things that you specifically wish we had done a little more work on or wanted another example on, you'll need to email me and let me know that for the uh, example lecture, you would really appreciate an example of and then let me know what it is. Um, I will try to make sure we do uh, a few different examples. Um, and then the very last lecture, which will be more like um, a kind of uh, a lecture series that you might go to, I'll send you um, a, a set of options of different lectures that Dave and or I have done in the past that aren't just the structural lectures. They're usually something quite interesting. Um, there's ones on castings, um, mass timber. I think we've already provided the video for the mass timber one, so we might not include that just because it was so applicable for you guys within the context of your studio course. Um, and there's a few other kind of fun, interesting ones. I've done one on reciprocal frames, or Dave and I have done one on reciprocal frames. We've given that one in Australia and in Finland. Um, I've done one on representation of complex geometry, so that one's kind of fun. So I'll give you guys a series of options. I'll send it out on SurveyMonkey and we can have a vote on which one we want to have uh, for that last lecture. And that one's more sit back, get some popcorn, and you won't be tested on it. Um, I understand that you guys are absolutely overwhelmed right now. Uh, I've tried to keep the assignment this week um, uh, as as simple as possible in spite of the fact that it can be a complex topic. So what I've done is I've tried to make the easier steps of the calculation uh, where all the points are based um, and very little towards the heavy end of the math that is more you're expected to try the math but there's less riding on the fact if you get it wrong. So you know all of the factors will be given a point, pulling out all the factors will be given some points you know, what, taking it um, a step at a time where, is really going to be where all the point value is. Um, so just to try to ease your burden a little bit, or at least not panic that so much of the mark is coming from. Sorry, I just heard a kid fall when I was waiting for tears, but it seems to be okay. Um, the other thing I really... I really wanted to do, but there's a very strong reason why I can't. What I what I really contemplated was, and again, I can't do this, was um, having the due date remain for all of the remaining assignments, but have the actual, oh, I just realized I need to fix something that I just did. I posted, hmm. uh, I have to do it right now or else I'm going to forget. I have to stop the recording. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I realized I forgot I had given you an extension on assignment six, so I had posted the answers. And I, so it was like only like five minutes, so I needed to go back and take those down just until the assignments go out. 
So this touches on what I had hoped to do for the remaining assignments, which was um, just allow to, to me to, to, for me not to review the marks uh, and have the marks unpenalized allowed to be posted up until the end of the term. But the problem then is I can't post the answers. And I think the answers are very important for the people who learn uh, but sequentially. Um, so making those available, I think, is equally important. Um, so I struggled with it. I just want you to know that I'm thinking of ways to try to make the burden easier on you. But there is still a certain amount of requirements um, that we have to satisfy just because of accreditation and fairness uh, to the program. So, you know, I'm kind of caught in this spot where I want to do whatever I can for you guys because uh, I get it, but still maintain the integrity of the program. Uh, if there's something that you think could be helpful, you just have to let me know. Take the time to email me, and if you think there's something that could make it helpful, I would definitely try to do that. Um, uh, making extensions on the assignments um, sounds like it's a wonderful thing, um, but it can actually just snowball. So the other thing I was thinking is, well, what if I just made the assignments um, make the due dates remain the same, but be available without penalty until the last day of classes, which is not the last day of the term, but the last day of classes. So like, well, I could do that um, and then make the answers available then, uh, but I am worried then that the people who do have a tendency to procrastinate will actually find themselves in a worse position because they'll get to the last day and have all the remaining assignments left to do while still trying to do studio um, that I'm worried it would snowball on you. And they, they've actually asked us not to do that sort of thing. So um, anyway, I get it. Uh, they, the administration is overwhelmed. Um, they are, I, I get emails from them at all hours trying to find ways to help you guys. Um, I'm overwhelmed, but I can't imagine what you guys are going through. Whether you're with a big family, whether you're with just one partner, um, or if you're all by yourself. Oh, I don't know which one of those is the worst because they're all horrible right now. Um, so I get it, but there's, I feel like we're at the limit of what we can do without actually making the problem worse for you guys. But again, feel free to email me if you think there's something. So this week, we're going to address the bending and shear design of wood elements. The good thing and stiffness. So this is where like we did with the steel, tracking those allowable deflection limits are very important. Um, the good thing is, is we've already talked about all the factors in wood. We've talked about wood already. So this isn't going to be a long lecture. Um, I have three fully worked out examples. Um, if you think you're, if you really prefer practicing examples, try stopping the video or turning off the video, trying the examples yourself, and then you can follow along with the answers worked out with me. And then there are two more full examples in your assignment that you guys will get to do. And the answers to those will be posted uh, next week, obviously. So that'll give you five fully worked out bending shear stiffness problems um, where we have final answers that yes, these bending elements work. Um, so let's dig in to those. So last week, I'm going to just run through again quickly all of those factor tables that we looked at. Um, the very first thing we looked at was grade category. So if you guys remember, knowing what grade category it was told us which one of the strength and stiffness tables we needed to refer to. And so based on what grade of lumber and the dimensions, told us whether we were using uh, light framing stud, structural light framing, joist and planks, beam and stringer, post and timber, or plank decking. And once we knew that, we would know whether we were looking at table A, B, C, or D. And on each of these tables, we have the species breakdown, the grade breakdown, and then all of the different uh, capacities. So remember, wood, wood fails in a brittle fashion. Oh, thank you. Um, 
wood fails in a brittle fashion. So we don't have to worry about plastic behavior. We only have elastic behavior. At the end of the elastic behavior, our member fails. In compression, everything's kind of failing uniformly unless it's buckling. Bending, you remember, actually this one's a good one to show it because it's got the lines on it. You guys remember that when we were looking at steel, the top would compress and the bottom would stretch. And not much would happen along this neutral axis. And what we cared about in the elastic zone was when this top piece up here compressed too much or this bottom piece down here stretched too much. And if those failed, that's it, our member fails. In steel, we let it yield all the way down to the neutral axis sometimes. But here we don't have that backup safety mechanism. It's wood. So if we hit that extreme maximum stress, possible limit that our wood could hit here and here, and it'll hit those at the same time, we'll have failure. So we limit these to the, uh, the maximum stress at the extreme fiber for bending. <coughs> compression, we were worried about uh, compression parallel to grain because it was like we had a series of straws here and we were worried about pushing on it. So now we will be looking at the bending at the extreme fiber in MPA. So this is the maximum stress we possibly want to see here and here. And if we hit it here and here, we'll be fine everywhere else through the depth of it. We also need to worry about shear. So this is about our elements slipping past each other, that act of having a plane slip past each other. So we'll also have to look up our shear values. And then remember in compression, we were worried about um, uh, the, uh, because it was in the strength part of the equation, we were worried about that, um, you know, 5% uh, probability range within our average curve. We're going to be talking about stiffness for a beam as well. So you can imagine, not only when it be it's bending, that's well, easier to bend it this way without worrying about buckling. If, we're, if we've got this here, you can imagine if this is my very precious drywall and it is essentially glued to the bottom of it. And when this bends, uh-oh, look at that. I failed my, my drywall underneath. No one's going to die. It's not a life safety requirement. Um, but we want to preserve that. So for stiffness alone, we're going to pull out the actual modulus of elasticity. Remember when we were talking about columns, it was still modulus of elasticity, but it was embedded in our strength equation because we were worried about buckling. So even though it was a stiffness problem, it was a stiffness problem within our strength equation. So we took the lower bound level of allowable stiffness to occur, or uh, 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 deformation to occur. So here we're taking somewhere more in the middle range. So we have four different tables that we might need to refer to for those elements. We talked about the load duration factor and I said standard is standard. Unless I tested you on something different, it's going to be standard. Uh, if it is not part of a system, the system factor is one. So if it's essentially, if it's not a stud or it's not a joist, it's not a system and we would use a factor of one. If you see the word stud or the word joist, it can ring a bell that it is probably going to be part of a system. And if it is a regular old house that we're building, it's going to meet these clauses. I can guarantee you it'll meet case two. If it's a normal house, We've met case two. Let's just take that as my word, um, which basically means we have a very particular nailing pattern um, and we've got sheathing on the top. Um, and I can tell you that if we're building a normal house, we've met that. So uh, in that case, we get to use case two for bending and our shear factor. Look at this. We get to multiply it by 1.4. Did you just... Pick up? Oh, you just... He picked up something off the floor and ate it. I didn't see, I didn't see the banana bread in his other hand. <laughs> I know we're a year into COVID, but I can get you new food. <laughs> I 
we're all functioning on very little sleep today. I don't know why. It doesn't help that I've started running again. I did 16, no, 14K the other day, so I'm feeling a little bit stretched. <laughs> All right, then we had our service condition factor. So if we were outside in a wet environment or inside maybe in a pool environment where humidity can be very, very high, we have to worry about um, the possibility of rot for it getting wet and drying and wetting, getting wet and drying. So in those conditions, it, it gives us uh, uh, requirements based on the member size, and then we can have reductions in um, our service condition factor for bending, or shear, or compression, uh, or tension, or modulus of elasticity. So we're talking about bending, and shear, and stiffness today. So these are the ones, KSB, KSV, and KSE, that we'll probably need to pull off of this table. The treatment factor is basically if we've got pressure treated lumber is what we're talking about here. And if it's untreated lumber, KT is one because it doesn't really have an impact on it. Even if it's regular pressure treated lumber but not incised, it's one. And I can tell you a two by four and a four by four and a two by six are rarely incised. Um, a a two by eight, it really depends on the mill. Because I've gotten pressure treated two by eights that are not incised, and I've gotten pressure treated two by eights that are incised. Isn't that what you found as well, Dave? A two by eight's kind of touch and go, but a two by ten is almost always incised. I don't think I've ever seen a pressure treated two by ten that's not incised. Yeah, it's, it's sort of in there is the threshold anyway. Yeah, but I've, we have a 2x8 sitting. I didn't think 2x8s would come in size, but I have one out in the backyard that is in size, and I was very surprised to find an in size 2x8. It turns out it just depends on, on whether they feel like turning off the, um, the incising blades or not when they're doing <laughs> the pressure treating. So it, it's a bit random for dimensional lumber. Yeah, but, I, but you will not find 2x4s or two by sixes in size, yeah. I've ne or a four by four. I've never, ever seen but those six in by size. Sixes, you will. Six by sixes, definitely. No, I mean, yeah. can find. Yeah. Not get, not. Can find. That's right. Not for sure. Um, and fire treated lumber. I like I said, I've never done it. Dave's never done it, and he's done a lot more um, kind of large scale timber construction than I have. I tend to focus, I, my career was mostly steel, like feature steel and like high-end steel buildings, but Dave's done a lot more lumber and he hasn't done fire retarded lumber either. Size factor, hmm, you guys hated me, I'm sure, for size factor with compression elements. Bending elements, a lot easier. We actually just get to pull it off a table here. So bending and shear, we look at what the larger dimension is, and we look at what the smaller dimension is, and we can pull off what the factor is for size. Remember, the, uh, the um, bigger the element, the smaller the reduction factor, or we lower the capacity of the element, because the odds of a knot being hidden somewhere in the element go up. So, Let's jump into the equation. So I'll go through the equations, and then there's not much to this lecture, but really digging into all three examples. Um, there's not a lot of theory here because we've already talked about all the theory. We've covered it in last week. We talked about it when we were doing uh, bending stress and strain. So this lecture is very much a practical lecture. Uh, so we have um, our equation for bending design. Do you guys remember that when we were talking about uh, bending stress, when we were just talking about kind of normal old bending stress, we had M equals stress times our shape property, which was our uh, section modulus. Well, this is our bending design equation for wood. 
Well, we have an R here, so we know there's got to be a reduction factor. So there's our reduction factor that lets us put this little R here. FB, we know that people get lazy of trying to find the Greek symbols on uh, tech, uh, in, while they're writing. So, so we, we often refer to stress, especially when we're talking about our upper bound stress, with an F. In steel, it was FY because that was our yield stress. Last week when we talked about wood compression, it was FC um, for wood in compression. And we had it when we pulled it off the table as a lowercase. And then once we made it an uppercase, it meant we had applied all our factors. So this is our stress, or this value right here. And S is our section modulus right here. So, so far these equations are the same. This is our size factor in bending, which we just know means that there could be a knot hidden in there somewhere, uh, so we want to make sure we apply that factor. And this is our lateral restraint factor. Remember when we talked about uh, uh, columns, both steel and wood, we had a buckling factor. When we talked about steel and bending, we knew that the top cord had a tendency to buckle. The bottom cord didn't because it was usually in tension. And we had uh, a whole extra bit on our steel equation for that. In wood, it's just KL. And I'll go, I'll show you that in the next slide. So our capital FB is our lowercase FB, which is what we pull off of our tables once we know our grading category, we can pull off what our uh, maximum stress we can allow in this member to be. Then we multiply it by all of our factors, our duration factor, our system factor, our service factor, and uh, our treatment factor. Section modulus um, for a rectangle, most wood elements are a rectangle, whether it is A single element by itself or multiple plies screwed together, we still have a depth and a width or D and B or D and B. And we know that the election elastic section modulus for rectangles is B, D squared divided by six. We actually together derived that equation. So we know that for a rectangle, S is really easy. B, D squared divided by six. We've actually derived that for rectangles. So this is the size factor. And so the only thing now we don't know in any of this, well, the material reduction factor is uh, 0.9 in bending, so similar to what we had in steel. The only thing we don't know is this lateral restraint factor. Everything else we have been able to look up. We, we did the exact same thing in our compression equations. So the lateral uh, restraint factor is uh, a little bit easier in wood. Basically, what they say is if it's stocky enough, it's not going to try to rotate or have that lateral torsional buckling uh, factor happen. So KL is one, provided that the ends are restrained from laterally rotating and the depth to width ratio does not exceed. And then there's a series of possible uh, uh, um, uh, classifications. So let's break it down. What does restrain from laterally rotating at the ends mean? So our wood member either abuts something with a hanger or sits on top of something. If it sits on top of something and there's just a series of them side by side, when our element bends, there's nothing to stop the ends from rotating at the top. And remember, that's where we get really concerned about it. So basically what they're saying is, either we've, we've nailed in the full depth, or we've blocked in in between. 
So often we'll see requirements for blocking, for bending elements. Uh, and then the depth to width ratio does not exceed, and they say one to four if there are no intermediate supports on the compression edge. So no blocking or not screwed into plywood. One to five if the member is held in line by purlins or tie rods. One to six if the compression edge is held in line by direct connection of decking or joists spaced no more than 6-10 millimeters apart. 7.5 to 1 if the compression edge is held in line by direct connection of decking or joists no more than 6-10 apart and bridging or blocking is provided. And 9 to 1 if both edges are held in line. So if you have something less than 4 to 1, you're going to be fine. So basically, if you have a stocky element, your problems kind of go away. So what we're saying here, if the D to B ratio is less than these, meeting these criteria, we're okay. We get to use a one. So basically, it's a lot harder to end up having lateral torsional buckling in a wood element. It's a lot harder to achieve it, which means that's a good thing. It's less likely to be governed by buckling or buckling of the top cord of our element. It's more likely to be governed simply by strength, which makes our calculations a lot easier. So what you do is you uh, figure out what D is and what B is, and then you divide both by the value of B. So for example, if we had a 2 by 4, a 2 by 4 is Eighty nine to thirty eight. Let's divide both of them by thirty eight. So eighty nine divided by thirty eight equals two point four three or two point three four. Sorry. To one. So the depth to width ratio of a two by four is two point three four to one we would never have to worry about buckling being, or in bending, lateral torsional buckling, or the top cord buckling, is not something we'd have to worry about with a 2x4. We would just be okay. It would fail in strength before it could ever possibly buckle. It doesn't mean it works better. It means strength will govern first. Uh, as we get deeper, slent, more slender members, well, maybe we would need to start to worry about it. Let's think about a 2x12. Uh, a so a 2x12 is 11.25 inches times 25.4, or 286 to 38. Let's divide both of those by 38. It would be 7.5 to 1. So if we wanted to use a 2 by 8 all by itself in bending, and we wanted to use a KL of 1, we would have to make sure that the compression edge has decking or joists no more than 610 apart, and that there's bridging or blocking at no more than 8 times the depth of the member, or 8 times 286, or no more than 2.8 two five meters. So we would need blocking every 2.25 meters down the length of the member. If we had a two by a two by 12 and we wanted to make sure we didn't have to worry about lateral buckling of the top cord, we would just have to meet this criteria and then we could use one. Shear design. Here is our reduction factor for shear. Remember, uh, shear is based on the area that can resist shear. Um, for steel, we only got to take the web of the element, but our wood beams are a rectangle. Now, if you guys remember, it was the average of the stress distribution in our steel element along the web. 
which was about two-thirds of the maximum stress. So in a wood element, it's going to be the same. And look, it's embedded right here, two-thirds of the net area. Uh, we have our maximum stress that we can let our object see, which is the stress for the grade and species multiplied by all the factors. Uh, here are the factors. And this looks, and then we have a net area, which is just B and D for a rectangular section. So we still have reduction factor, stress, times a shape property, which in our case is area. And then because it's stress, we have some factors in there for the fact that it's wood and two-thirds of the average stress. So let's compare what these factors look like. In wood, MR is our reduction factor times our capital FB, uh, our section modulus, our uh, size factor, and our buckling factor. <clears throat> in steel, it was our reduction factor uh, times MP, which was really just about our stress times our section modulus. And then this was our buckling factor. So really, the equations look the same. If we say that this size factor is solely on the fact that this is wood because of the, the fact of the material that it's wood, these two equations, as much as they look vastly different, are really the same. And shear, uh, we had we have uh, our reduction factor for uh, wood and shear, the maximum stress our wood can see with all of the factors abide, and two thirds of our net area again times the size factor. In steel, reduction factor times the area of the steel that can resist shear times FS. But this was just two thirds of our steel stress. So same as this two thirds here. So as much as they look different, they're really just slight variations of the same equation with the fact that wood is organic and non-isotropic built in. So both of them are for bending, a reduction factor, times the maximum stress we can see, times our shape factor, which is the section modulus, and then factors built in for the material and buckling. And then for shear, both of them are the reduction factor, the maximum stress we want to let our material see, times two-thirds, because we're taking the average of that stress distribution, times area, which is a shape property, and then some factors built in for, for steel, there really isn't any factors, uh, and for wood, we build in factors for the fact that it is organic um, and non-isotropic. So at their core, they are still those basic, basic equations we talked about in lecture three of this term. We're just building on them and varying them slightly for each material that we talk about. Concrete's going to be even more complicated. Uh, but I'll take it through. Surprisingly, concrete ends up being the, one of the easiest calculations in the end. As much as it can be very intimidating, it can end up being a very easy calculation. So the one thing we haven't talked about is serviceability. Remember, serviceability is not a strength requirement. So we would be using our serviceability limit states load cases for this. And remember, we were always tracking two. We were tracking dead plus snow and snow by itself, or dead plus live or live by itself, and comparing them to two different criteria. When we were talking about steel, we found the easiest way to try to compare things was rather than talk about it in terms of deflection, because both um, uh, moment of inertia I and deflection are in these equations, we switched it around and talked about it in terms of I. So we brought deflection under here and I over here and figured out what I required we needed. And our I required needed to be uh, 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 less than our I actual. We needed to make sure we had um, an I actual greater than the minimum I we needed to have. Wood 
It was easy with steel because E is 200,000 MPa. We could write it in terms of I, no problem. In wood, E is different for every uh, species and every grade um, of our material. So we have reams and reams of different options for E. So they said, you know what, to make this a little bit easier, let's pull E out of the equation as well. And we'll write our serviceability requirements in terms of EI. So I, we know, is um, uh, uh, a, uh, a shape property. And if we're talking about a W section, we can go look it up easily enough. But we know that for a rectangle, Uh, for a rectangle, I is BD cubed divided by 12. We discovered that way back in lecture four. Um, so we'll just rearrange this to be EI. That, what is the minimum EI of our member that we need to satisfy this criteria? Um, the wood book writes E as ES, um, uh, and that just means we've taken our E and applied any of the factors. Remember that we had um, treatment factors that could apply to stiffness, and then we had an actual uh, serviceability E um, uh, modifier or uh, factor that we needed to build in. So really, we need to make sure that we have a very particular EI required, or what is the minimum EI? And I can guarantee you that these handy dandy wood books are going to have, if we can calculate what MR we need and what VR we need and what ESI we need, we probably have some tables in this book that will list all the different members with those uh, values for us. Remembering that it would probably be the ideal conditions where most of our factors are one, um, except for our size factor because that would actually be built into uh, the definition of that member. Um, so if it is wet, we would need to probably actually still do something by hand because this wouldn't be exact anymore. So let's jump in. We have three examples. I've given you all the information you know now. You need to know now. If you like to practice ahead of time, I'm that way. I would always prefer to say, okay, here's the example. I'm going to go practice it on my own. Probably get the first one horribly wrong, but here's the worked out solution so I can learn what I did wrong. If I just follow along, I have a harder time kind of getting it, but I know some people prefer to follow along first. So if you're a person that likes to practice with examples, pause here uh, and then jump back in and try the example. So example one says, determine the shear and bending capacity of an SPF number one, number two, 38 by 184 at 16 inches center to center floor joist to be used in a conventional house with plywood floor sheathing. So there's a few things we can probably just assume from that right off of the bat, but we'll go through it step by step and figure out what we know and what we need to know. But we know that if it's inside in a conventional house, that means it's probably not exposed to the environment, which means we don't have to worry about it being in a wet environment. Um, the keyword joist here to me seems like it's probably part of a system, seems like a conventional house, seems like we'd probably be able to say that since, since this thing is at 16, 16 inches, inches on center, center, probably part of a system. So that might help us out. They told us that they are uh, two by eights um, that are being used in the system. So we know that they're a two by eight, and that's an SPF number one, number two. Now I can tell you that SPF number one, number two is the most widely used wood material around. That's what everything at Home Depot is, unless you ask for something specific or hunt for more, you can get select structural, but it's almost always number one, number two. And two by eights as floor joists, pretty darn common as well. So this seems like something that would get used all the time. Now, there's nothing about how long it is here, which is interesting, 
because the shear and bending capacity seem to have nothing to do with length involved in them. So let's take a look and see, go through the process of what we know and what we need to know. So maybe we should start going all the way back and figure out what grade category we are. So we know we're a 2 by 10 or a, a 38 by 184. Um, and we know that it was SPF number one, number two. So it doesn't look like we're light framing. It doesn't look like we're stud because we weren't a stud grade. Um, smaller dimension. Well, we're 38, but our larger dimension was more than 89. So it doesn't look like we're structural light framing. Now, you can see right here that it says structural joists and planks. It's probably this one, but let's just make sure. We have 38 as our smaller dimension and something greater than 114. So this does seem to be, and we have a grade of number one, number two. So it does seem like we fit the structural joists and planks category. So whatever table includes structural joists and planks seems to be the one that we would need. Let's see. Well, table A, structural joist and plank. This seems like the table we're going to need. We know that we had spruce pine fir, We had spruce pine fir, structural joists and planks. We know we have number one, number two, and that we need uh, FB, FV, and E. So it looks like These are the values that we're going to need to do this information, to, do, to follow through on these calculations. So let's start writing all that out. So we, want, we have an SPF number one number two, 38 by 184 at 16 inches center to center. And we want to know MR and VR. So what we know Let's write out what we know uh, about wood in bending and shear, or about our piece of wood for bending. And shear. Well, we know that the reduction factor for wood in bending is 0 0.9, and we know that the reduction factor for wood in shear is 0 0.9. We know that the grade category is structural joist and plank. And because of that, we went and looked at the appropriate table and we pulled off FB was 11.8 MPA and FV equals 1.5 MPA. And we also got E, which was 9,500 MPA. We know some stuff about our member. We know that D equals 184 millimeters. We know that B equals 38 millimeters. 
we could figure out our net area because net area is just D times B or 38 times 184 gives us 6,992 millimeters squared. And we might as well figure out our section modulus. You know, we know when we're talking about bending, we like that shape property. So these are all just shape properties. Uh, and section modulus for a rectangle is B D squared divided by six, or 38 times 184 squared divided by six, or 38 times 184 squared divided by six, gives us 214,442. Where are you going? I've got a couple of calls, so I'm just going to go up, go for a drive, and get, maybe get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I already know all this stuff. <laughs> so 214,442 millimeters cubed is another shape property. So those are some things we know about our member. Let's start pulling off our factors. So see you at some point. Um, let's go back to those tables and we'll look at our factors one at a time. We'll go through them all and then we'll come back and write them all down together. Let's go back. I'm going to erase that just so that we can come back next time. All right, load duration factor. We know it's going to be one. If nothing else weird is going on, it's going to be one. Uh, system factor. If it's not part of a system, it's got a factor of one, but it said it was a joist. And we know studs and joists are usually part of a system. Um, and that I've said if it was kind of a conventional old house, it's probably a case two system. The question even said that there was uh, some plywood, I believe, on it. Um, so, well, look at this. We've got plywood, normal nailing. Seems like we get to say it's a case two system. So KH for bending is 1.4 and for shear is 1.4. So it looks like we have a, uh, a, an increase in strength because if that one joist tries to deflect down, it brings the plywood floor with it, which is tied to two more joists. So we get a little tiny bit of capacity out of the fact that there's two joists on either side of it. The next factor, service condition factor. Well, it's inside. So if it's a dry service condition, everything is one. Treatment factor. Uh, again, we're untreated and inside. So one, we know it's untreated because why would you bother to treat something inside? So factor one. Size factor. When we were doing compression, we had to, uh, when we're doing compression parallel to the grain, we had to use a very complicated formula. Well, for us, we get to pull it off a table now because we're talking about bending and shear. So larger dimension. Our larger dimension was 184. So we come down here and we've got 184 to 191. And smaller dimension, we have a smaller dimension of 38. So it looks like we get to use a KZB and a KZV of 1.2. So we get an increase in capacity based on the fact that this visually graded lumber is probably pretty accurately visibly graded because the odds of there being a big knot hidden inside it are very low because we can see all of the sides of it. So if it looks like there's no major flaws in it, there probably aren't any major flaws in it. 
So those were all the factors we could look up except for the lateral restraint factor. So let's come here to this and we'll write down all the factors we know and we'll come back to this in just a minute. So let's start writing down all of our factors. So our load duration factor we saw was one. We looked up um, uh, our system factor, and it was 1.4 for bending and shear, because it is part of the system. Our service factor was 1 for all of our bending, shear, and stiffness values. Our treatment factor was 1 because it was untreated. And KZB and KZV, which were our size factors, we looked up were both 1.2. So the only one we have left is KL. Now KL is all about our ratio. So we want to know what our depth to width ratio is. We have a 184 to 38. Well, that's the same as dividing both by 38, and we have a 4.84 to 1 ratio. So let's take a look at the tables for that. Well, we're greater than 1.4, so uh, we, we know it's a normal house, so the ends we can assume would be laterally uh, restrained from laterally rotating. That would be common. Uh, we don't meet the lowest category, so let's see uh, what's next. Well, we don't really know what purlins or tie rods are, but if the compression edge is held in line by direct connection of decking or joists, well, we have decking, and we're less than 6.5 to 1. We saw that we had a plywood floor on there, so it looks like no problem we meet this 6.5 criteria, which means we do, in fact, get to use a KL of 1. So let's take a look at our equations now. We know that MR equals our reduction factor for bending, times our capital FB, times our section modulus, times our size factor for bending, times our lateral restraint factor. Well, we know this value, we know this value, we know this value, and we know this value. The only thing we don't know is FB. FB equals our lowercase FB times KD times KH for bending, times our serviceability factor for bending, times our treatment factor for bending. Or we've got 11.8 times 1 for KD. I'm not even going to write it in. KHB is 1.4. Uh, KSB is 1, and KT is 1. So I'm not going to write any of those in. I'm just going to write the 1.4 in. We've got 11.8 times 1.4. We end up with 16.52 MPA. So that was the only thing we had left unknown. We know our reduction factor for bending. We've already written down up here, 0.9. FB, we just calculated as 16.52 MPA. Our section modulus is just a shape property, and this is a rectangle, so we've already calculated it. It's 214,442 times our size factor, which we looked up, is 1.2, times our lateral restraint factor, of 1. 
we have 0.9 times 16.52 times 214,442 times 1.2 times 1 if you want to get particular. Oh, times 1. We end up with 3,825,988 newtons, newton millimeters. Well, we know that's a pain in the butt, and we like to write it in kilonewton meters. So let's just divide it by 1,000 and divide it by 1,000 to switch it to kilonewton meters. And we end up with 3.826 kilonewton meters. Let's take a look at VR. VR is our reduction factor for shear times capital FV times two-thirds our net area times our size factor for shear. Well, we know that FV, capital FV, is really our lowercase FV times our different factors and our different factors are our, uh, our load duration factor times our service or our system factor times our serviceability factor times our treatment factor. Well, KD is one. KH, well, actually FB for shear, we looked up is 1.5. KD is 1, KHV is 1.4, our KSV is 1, and our KT is 1. So we've got 1.5 times 1.4 is 2.1 MPA. So we can figure out what VR is now. We know that our reduction factor for wood in shear is 0 0.9. Our capital FV we just calculated is 2.1 MPA times 2 thirds times our net area, which we calculated is 6,992 times our size factor, or our, yeah, our size factor for uh, uh, shear is 1.2. So we've got 0 0.9 times 2.1 times 2 thirds times 6,992 times 1.2 gives us 10,572. But that's in newtons. We like things in kilonewtons at this point. So we calculate that this is 10.6 kilonewtons. So we have calculated that SPF number 1, number 2, 38 by 184 at 16 inches center to center has an MR of 3.83 kilonewton meters and a VR of 10.6 kilonewtons. So that's what they asked of us. They didn't ask us to compare it to anything. They didn't ask us to tell them, you know, does this member work in a particular situation? That's not what they've asked. They just asked us to calculate MR and VR. So a relatively easy one. Let's take a look if there are any tables that we can compare this to. Oop, I've mostly just moved this completely. What have I done? Bring you back over here. So let's take a look at the PDF that I have uploaded for you guys. Here is bending members that we can refer to. And if we scroll through this, we will find some sawn lumber joist selection tables. So look at this. You can see here joist selection tables. 
for 38 wide millimeter members, and these are bending members. And we have different sizes, different species, and different grades. Well, we know we're talking about number one, number two, SPF. And we were talking about a number one, number two, SPF, 30, 38 by 184. Let's take a look. Single member, so that means not part of a system. But look at this, they have a version when it is part of a system, or system case two, which is pretty darn normal. So we've got number one, number two, SPF, 38 by 184, come across to our system case two. 3.83 for MR and 10.6 for VR. That is exactly what we manually calculated. So it looks like these are pretty reliable tables. Now, if this had been outside and we had a wet environment, this table wouldn't apply anymore. It would be close because we know those modifiers are close. So we'd be able to see if we were in the right range, but we would definitely have to do that calculation manually because it only says it uh, for, um, uh, for kind of interior conditions, untreated members. So let's take a look at our next example. So you can see here, that's all worked out for you. Again, I even tell you what tables you can refer to. Uh, and then down here, you can see the actual table that we just pulled back from. So let's try our next example. This one seems to be a little bit harder. They said, we're building a deck outside with structural select cedar. Remember, cedar is northern. And we're hoping a built-up 2-ply, 2 2x10 2 member will work for the 2.8 meter span. Someone has already figured out the loads that are on it. We have uh, a factored load of 7.4, a dead plus live serviceability load of 5 kilonewtons per meter, and a live load all by itself of 4.6 kilonewtons per meter. We need to make sure that shear and bending and serviceability work. They've told us to ignore the uh, published values and have asked us to check against a dead and live serviceability criteria of L divided by 240 and a live by itself of L divided by 360. There's so much variation depending on what table you look at. Um, as much as I've given you guys a table, uh, I will tell you explicitly, I think at this point, what dead and live criteria to use just because you know, some of you remember that it got changed near the end of structures one. And so just to take away all ambiguity, I will ask you specifically what serviceability criteria to use. It'll just, it'll just make sure we're all on the same page. So let's start digging in to problem number two. Somebody's already done some of the beginning work for us, but we have to kind of go back and remember some of the things we learned in Structures 1 for this. So we have a 2-ply, uh, a 2 by 10 with a length of 2.8 meters, and we know that it is select structural cedar, which is northern. Cedar falls in the northern category and it is select structural. It's a deck so it's definitely outside. Cedar we don't treat because we use treatment to help it preserve against rot. Cedar it has natural inherent properties that do that so that's one of the things people like about cedar is that we don't have to pressure treat it. So it would be untreated, but it is outside. Well, what a pain in the butt. The example I have here has different values than what are in the question sheet. Why would I have done that? What in 
sweet Jiminy Cricket was I doing? Let me take a look and follow through to make sure we're all working on the same problem together here. Uh, serviceability. Okay, team, so it looks like I'm going to make a quick edit to this. I feel like I've gone through this before and somehow keep making this mistake. Just bear with me a quick second here. These are the technical difficulties that we encounter periodically. So this is supposed to be actually 6.2. This is supposed to be 4.2. This is supposed to be 3.8. So I'll update this and repost it onto the, uh, the, the Quercus for you as well. So from current slide, swap. I just want to, I just want to zip ahead and make sure that I do in fact Okay, so the worked out example is using those values fully and completely. So we're going to just start from scratch using these numbers here. We haven't done anything yet, so it doesn't really change anything for what we've done. So the first thing we have to figure out is if we know that we need MF to be less than MR and VF to be less than VR and the, uh, the ESI required to be less than the EIS actual, we have to figure out what all those things are. So the very first thing we need to figure out is what is MF and VF? And what is the allowable deflection criteria? So this takes us all the way back to structures one. So they gave us WF equals 6.2 kilonewtons per meter. W for dead plus live equals 4.2 kilonewtons per meter. And that W for live all by itself is 3.8 kilonewtons per meter. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what our MF and VF are. We know that we have a beam That is 2.8 meters long. We know that we have a load on it that is WF for strength, because we're looking for MF and VF. They've given us that. And we know that there are reactions here keeping it in place. We don't have to do method of sections, but we know we could go through and do method of sections to find out what M are, MF and VF are. But we also know that we managed to derive that equation last term. And from our beam loading diagrams, if we wanted to, we could look up that MF equals WF L squared divided by 8, which is 6.2 times 2.8 squared divided by 8, or 6.2 times 2.8 squared divided by 8 equals 6.08 kilonewton meters. So we need an MR greater than 6.08 kilonewton meters. VR is WFL divided by 2, or 6.2 times 2.8 divided by 2. 6.2 times 2.8 divided by 2 equals 8.68 kilonewtons. So we need a VR greater than that. 
We also know that we can calculate our, oh my goodness, I've done all kinds of things here. Small change that I'm going to make again in this. Oh, guys, sorry. Remember, there's different deflection criteria depending on what uh, criteria are being used. Um, so, but they've told us explicitly to use live divided, or for live load alone, to use L divided by 300. Okay, so let's figure out our deflection limits or deflection allowable for dead plus live is our length divided by 240 or 2800 divided by 240. is 11.7 millimeters. So that's the most we'd let that deflect. And for live all by itself, the allowable deflection is L divided by 300, or 2,800 divided by 300. point three three millimeters. So they've given us what deflection criteria they wanted to use. So we have some limits now that we can work towards. Now we can start thinking about what we know about our, uh, our wood member for the design side. What we know. Well, we know that uh, we have a reduction factor for wood in bending equals our reduction factor for wood in shear of 0 0.9. Uh, we don't know what our grading is. We should go back and figure out what some of those things are. So let's take a look here. Let's come back here. Now, for the determination of the strength of the material, we know that we have two 2 by 10s but each one individually is going to be what we talk about right here. So we don't have 38 plus 38. We will make that work together, but it is not what we have. So we have a smaller dimension of 38 and a larger dimension of, we have a 2 by 10, so a 2 by 10 is 235. So it's not a stud because we know it's select structural cedar. Uh, we have 38 and we do have 114 or more. So we have select structural 38 and we have a 114 or more. So it looks like we're structural joists and planks. That's kind of kooky. Well, the beams and stringers were when we were using something somewhat chunky. Look, we needed something 114 or more as the smaller dimension. So well outside of the range of this. And plank decking uh, maybe might have worked except it was select or commercial. So the only thing that meets all of our criteria are the structural joist and plank table. So that means specified strengths and modulus of elasticity for structural joists and planks. We have northern we have northern select structural and we want FB, FV, and E. So 
So we have um, a bending strength at the extreme fiber of 10.6, shear capacity of 1.3 MPa, and a modulus of elasticity of 7,500 MPa. So we can start writing all of that information down for ourselves. Our grade was a structural joists or planks. FB equals 10.6 MPA. We just went and looked that up. FV equals 1.3 MPA. Again, we looked that up. And E equals 7,500 MPA. We know our depth is, we have a 2 by 10. So let's just draw what that looks like here. So 38 and 38 and then a 10 inch beam is really only 2.95 inches deep or 235. So this in its entirety is 38 plus 38 or 76 for the overall properties. But remember when we look at the size of these visual grading is about looking at the perimeter. So we would get to count these as individuals when we're talking about the visual grading or the size visual grading coming up. But area and section properties, these would be screwed together to work as one member here. So let's see some of our properties here. Our depth is 235 millimeters. Our width overall is 76 millimeters. Our area or our net area is 76 by 235 or 76 by 235 equals 17,860 millimeters squared. Our section modulus, remember, is BD squared divided by 6. 76 by 235 squared divided by 6 is uh, 699,517 millimeters cubed. And we have one more section property. Remember, we're talking about uh, stiffness as well. So this was B times D. This was B times D squared divided by 6. And I for a rectangle is B times d cubed divided by 12. So we have 76 times 235 cubed divided by 12. It's a big number, maybe we'll write it, uh, we'll bring a, a, a thousand and a thousand. We've got 82.2 times 10 to the six millimeters to the four. So now we could probably go start thinking about our factors that we need to apply. Well, it's a standard situation, so KD is going to be 1. That's easy. KH, or our system factor, it's a B. It's not a stud or a joist, so it's not part of a system. We're just going to call that right now and say that it's a KH of 1. So that's for uh, bending and, and also for shear. So we're going to use 1. KH is just 1. Service condition factor. It is outside. So we have an element outside. It's a wet service condition of sawn lumber where we have a, uh, a, a dimension for our least dimension of 89 millimeters or less. Whether it's our 76 or our 38, we still meet this criteria. So these are the factors we need to apply. For bending at extreme fiber, 
our service condition is 0.84. Remember, we're saying if this is wet and outside, it's prone to rotting, so we're going to lower its strength. Shear, we're going to make it 0.96. And modulus of elasticity, we're going to make 0.94. So we're lowering the capacity of all of those things. KT, it is untreated. So whether it's dry or wet, the treatment factor is 1. Size factor. So we have a larger dimension of, of 235. And we have a smaller dimension of 38. Now I know you, you're saying, but we, we have 76. We have two plies. But this visual grading was based on each individual member. So there's not a knot hidden inside that couldn't be seen. We could see all four sides of this 38, these 38 millimeter wide members. So we're going to use the 235 by 38 for shear and bending is 1.1. So that gives us for shear and bending and that means the last size, or the last factor we need to worry about is KL, or the tendency of the top cord to buckle. Well, we need to know what ratio we have of B to D. Oops. I've taken that right off the screen. Sorry, I hurt my finger pretty badly a couple weeks ago. I dislocated it and tore a bunch of tendons in it, so my ability to use a mouse is somewhat uh, incapacitated. I have to go see a plastic surgeon and see if I need surgery on it or not. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's fine. Uh, but it's just a real pain in my behind at the moment. So let's write all those factors down, and then we'll do the calculation for uh, our 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 KL factor. So we calculated, or we looked up KD, and it equaled 1. That's the load duration factor. Our KH for bending and our KH for shear, we looked up. We're both 1 because it's not part of a system. We had three different factors for whether it was KSB, uh, which was 0 0.84, KSV, which was 0 0.96, and KSE, which was also, which was 0 0.94. So this is saying that because this is outside, there's a tendency or a, that if there is rot, we will assume that we've lowered our strength somewhat. Our treatment factor is 1 because it's untreated. Our size factor for uh, bending and for shear was the same. And this was based on a single ply of 2 by 10 material. And then KL is the only one we don't know. So we need to know what our depth to width ratio is. And we have 235 to 38. We can divide both of those by 38, and we get 6.18 to 1. So let's go back and look at our uh, criteria here. Well, we don't meet the first one or the second one. Um, we are less than 6.5, so if we can meet this criteria, we get to use a KL of 1. If the compression edge is held in line by direct connection of decking or joists. Well, this is a beam picking up deck or joists. We know it's outside uh, picking up either deck or joist. Something would have to be there on the top cord of it. And it would be pretty normal to be able to meet this criteria. You, I would be telling you something weird if we were well beyond these criteria. Um, I'm telling you that we pretty much always have a KL of 1, but we're just double-checking. It's a deck, 
So we're going to have something sitting on top of that element. So it does look like we will be able to have a KL of 1. So it looks like we can start doing some of our calculations now. Let's take a look at moment. We know that MR equals our reduction factor for bending times our capital FB times our, uh, our section modulus times our size factor for bending times our lateral restraint factor. Our capital FB is just our lowercase fb times our load duration factor times our system factor times our service factor times our treatment factor. Our FB we looked up was 10.6 times KD was 1, KHB was 1, KSB we do have a reduction here of 0.84 and then our treatment factor was 1. So we have 10.6 times 0.84, or 8.9 MPA. We have a reduction in strength here. So we can calculate MR. MR equals 0.9 times 8.9 times our section modulus, which we calculated over here, is 699,517 times our size factor, which is 1.1, times our lateral restraint factor, which is 1. So we've got 0.9 times 8.9 times 699,517 uh, millimeters squared times 1.1 times 1. And we get uh, 6,163,444, but that's in Newton millimeters. I am going to divide by 1,000 and divide by 1,000, giving me 6.16 .6 kilonewton meters. VR equals our reduction factor for shear times our capital FV times two-thirds our net area times our size factor. Well, our capital FV is our lowercase fv times our load duration factor times our system factor for shear, times our service factor for shear, times our treatment factor. Our shear stress, or the maximum shear stress we can see before it fails is 1.3, and then we get to apply our factors. Our KD is one. We don't have this as a system, so it's one times our service factor. It is outside, so we do see a reduction in strength capacity. And then our treatment factor is 1. So we essentially have 1.3 times 0.96, or 1.248 MPA. So VR equals 0 0.9, which is our reduction factor for shear. Uh, sorry, our FV we just calculated is 1.248 times 2 thirds times our net area, which we already calculated up here, 
is 17,860 times our size factor for shear, which we looked up, is 1.1. So we have 0 0.9 times 1.248 times 2 thirds times 17,860 times 1.1. That gives us 14,711, but that's in newtons. Let's divide by 1,000 to get this in kilonewtons. We get 14.71 kilonewtons. There was another thing we needed to figure out here, though. We also needed to figure out our serviceability requirements here. I just realized I have to go make my kids lunch, so I'm going to have to stop this here and pick it back up. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> for you guys, that was just a weird little blip, but for me, I had to go feed the hordes. Um, so the last thing we need to think about is serviceability. Remember they said we needed to make sure that the spending member was strong enough, so that means moment and shear, but also stiff enough, so that means serviceability. So not a life safety issue, but it is all about preservation of finishes. And unfortunately, that is the thing we get sued about the most as a team. So we know that for a... Um, a, uh, a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. So that means a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. We know that the, def the equation for maximum deflection is delta equals 5 WL4 divided by 384 EI. But we want to know what EI we need to meet that deflection criteria. And we have two different deflection criteria. We had deflection for dead plus live, and we had deflection for live all by itself. And we calculated those back here. We had the allowable deflection for dead plus live was 11.7 millimeters, and for live all by itself was 9.33 millimeters. But we want to know what EI we need. <clears throat> so we can rearrange this, uh, and we can write EI equals 5 WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 delta. So we can figure out what EI we need. Now for a dead plus live loading case, we can find out what EI we need. So that would be five. And the W, or the line load, the line load, the uniformly distributed line load for dead and live. So not our factored load, but dead and live together. They gave us that at the beginning as 4.2 kilonewtons per meter times our length, which was two, which is 2.8 meters, but we're talking about things uh, in millimeters and newtons here, so we need that in 2,800 to the power of 4 divided by 384 times our allowable dead live deflection limit, which was 11.7 or the maximum we want this deflection to actually be. And so we calculate an EI of 5 times 4.2 times 2,800 to the power of 4 divided by 384 divided by 11.7. And we get a pretty gosh darn big number. Now, they often tend to write this as times 10 to the 9. So you can see my calculator calculated this 
and it's times 10 to the 11. I want to write it as times 10 to the 9, so I just want to move my decimal place over two spots. And I have 287.3 times 10 to the 9 Newton millimeters squared. Don't worry about the units too much. What we care about is that this is the minimum EI we need. So we need an EI of at least this for our member. But we have two different deflection criteria. We want to know what EI is for the live case all by itself. And it's not obvious because the ratio of dead to live load versus the deflection limits can vary. So we have to check both of them. It won't always be dead and live governing, and it won't always be live governing. Each situation we need to think about independently. So we have to check both of these. So now we've got five times and our live load they gave us as 3.8 kilonewtons per meter. So 3.8 times our 2,800 divided by 384 times 9.33. And we calculate that and we get 5 times 3.8 times 2,800 to the power of 4 divided by 384 divided by 9.33. And we get something in the ten, times 10 to 11. I'm going to move my decimal, decimal place over two spots. And I get 326 times 10 to the 9 newtons per millimeter squared. So I need to know that, VR, that MR is greater than MF, VR is greater than VF, and that my uh, EI actual is greater than my EI allowable. So these are the minimum. This is what I require. I require an EI of this. Well, this is greater than this. If I need a minimum, if these are the minimums I need, it wouldn't include this if I said this was my minimum. But if this is my minimum, I will capture that. So it looks like the minimum EI I need, EI min that I need, is 326 times 10 to the 9 Newton millimeter squared. So that seems to be all the criteria I have, but I've calculated MF and MR, VF and VR. I've calculated the EI minimum that I need, but I don't know what EI actually is. Now, if you remember, they said that it was EI or ESI that we can calculate, but that just means that we're applying our factors to E, because remember, E has some factors, which is our KSE, or our serviceability factor for E, and also a treatment factor, then times I. Well, E, we looked up at the very beginning. It was on the same chart with FB and FB, and it was 7,500 MPA. So 7,500 times KSE. We looked up, and because it is outdoors in a wet environment, we have 0.94. It was untreated, so we had looked up that the treatment factor is 1 times I, which we calculated. We know for a rectangle, I is BD cubed divided by 12. And we calculated that to be uh, 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 82.2 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4, or 82.2 times 10 to the 6. So we can calculate what the actual EI is here, 7,500 times 0.94 times 82.6 times 10 to the 6. And we get 5.795 times 10 to the 11. I'm going to write it in the times 10 to the 9. They tend to often write, like to write these things in times 10 to the 3, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12. You actually, even in Excel, can set that 
So within the scientific notation option, you can set it to scientific notations in threes. So this gives us 500 and, oops, sorry, 500 and, 579.5 times 10 to the 9. Now we can start looking and seeing if this thing works. So does 2, 2 by 10, cedar select structural work? We need MF to be less than MR, VF to be less than VR, and the ESI required to be less than the ESI actual. So we have MF, we calculated MF at the beginning to be 6.08 kilonewton meters. We calculated VF to be equal 8 to 8.68 kilonewtons, and we just calculated the EI required to be 326 times 10 to the 9 newton millimeters squared. MR actual, we calculated MR as 6.17 kilonewton meters. We calculated VR as 14.7 kilonewtons. We calculated that. And we just calculated EI to be 579.5 times 10 to the 9 newton millimeters squared. Well, 6.17 is greater than 6.08. 14.7 is greater than 8.68. And 579.5 times 10 to the 9 is greater than 362 times 10 to the 9. So, yes. It works. I'll often put a big box around it so that I can see at a glance where the summation of all the work is. If you guys remember back when you learned to write essays, I always find how I write these calculations out as the exact same thing. Your open, opening paragraph was the summation of all your points. We need to know, does this work? Sometimes I might even write MR greater than MF, VR greater than VF, and EIS actual greater than EIS required. And then each step is writing out a, a point in our essay. And then think of this as the summary paragraph in your essay. So they're very similar and very logical if you think about it. This is where we're writing the summation of everything we just determined. So that was two of our three examples. Let's come along and look at, so you can see all of that is worked out right here. Um, let's take a look <clears throat> at that uh, design example that we have been working on for the past few weeks. We're designing a steel canopy for an existing building in Brampton. The dimensions are to be 5 by 6 with one long side supported by the existing building and two columns supporting the opposite side of the corners. The height of the canopy is to be 4 meters to match the existing building, which we've already learned in past weeks. And the snow load in Brampton is SS equals 1.3 and SR equals 0.4. Guys, I just want to go back. I just want to go back to something here in this. Um, when I was doing the size factor or the lateral restraint factor, Let's come back a bit more. Uh, I actually should have for this KL, we don't have just, we don't have just one um, member here. 
we don't have a 235 versus a, two, a, a dimension of uh, 38. We needed that for visually grading our lumber for our size factor, but our actual number is 76 by 235. And so this should actually be 76. So 235 divided by 76 is 3.09 to 1. So that was just a, a mistake on my part because I got distracted. We had just done our, uh, our grading, um, but I was just thinking about it, and this should actually be uh, 3.09. That means that easy peasy, we have met the minimum requirements here. We don't even have to think about it. We don't have to worry about lateral buckling on this thing. It's, it's just going to work for us. So, so sorry again that, that I uh, made that small mistake. mistake. You'll see here in the worked out example that it is correct. So that's less than the four to one. So you've got that right there. So now my distracted self can think about this question now. So you can see why I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to do those calculations one step at a time. So if you make a small mistake, you're not penalized everywhere through the process. Because it is easy to make a small mistake. And if the answer is just fully based on the total answer, I want to make sure you have some fallback. It's also why checking yourself is very important. Okay, so we had all of this information given to us for the steel design three weeks ago, four weeks if you count spring break. But in the beginning of our steel example, when we did the column calculation, we figured out what CF, MF, and VF was, and we figured out what the line load for dead and snow and snow by itself was on that beam. The contractor has suggested a cost savings by substituting wood members instead of steel. We looked at this last week. And we checked the column as a 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two. We now have the ability to check this 140 by 343 Douglas fir number one and see if it works for our situation. So from the steel design, there's already some things that we know. We already know our MF is 35 kilonewton meters, and we know our VF, our maximum VF, is 23.3. And we know our serviceability line loads. So let's start thinking about everything that we need to figure out. So let's we know what we want to figure out is does a 140 by 343 Douglas fir number one work? MF equals 35 kilonewton meters. VF equals 23.3 kilonewtons. And we know that the line load for dead plus snow equals 5.15 kilonewtons per meter, and that the line load for snow all by itself is 3.25 kilonewtons per meter. So we know that in the past, the very first thing we do is go check and see what we can figure out about our wood. The very first thing we do is figure out what grade category we're in. So our smaller dimension is bigger than all of these. It can only be one of these two categories because our smaller dimension is 140. Uh, and our bigger dimension exceeds our smaller dimension by more than 51. That means we're talking about a beam and stringer grade of material. And we have a number one, so it's true. We've met all of these criteria to fall into this. So we need to use the strength and stiffness requirements from the beam and stringer table. 
This is the joist to plank, light framing, and stud table. That's not what we need. This is the light framing, which we said we wouldn't even be using because we're not even looking at construction and standard grade. Here we are, beam and strainer grade. So, so we know, know. we have a beam, beam and stringer grade, We're talking about Douglas fir, number one. And we need our bending stress, our maximum bending stress, our maximum shear stress, and our modulus of elasticity. So if we come down, we see 15.8 MPA, 1.5 MPA, and 12,000 MPA for E. <clears throat> Let's write those things down because we're starting to figure out some things we know now. What we know. Well, the reduction factor for wood and bending is 0 0.9. The reduction factor for shear in wood is 0.9. Our grading is beam and stringer. We've looked up FB and it is 15.8 MPA. We've looked up FV and it is 1.5 MPA. And we've looked up E is 12,000 MPA. We know a few things about our member. We know that D equals 343 millimeters. We know B equals 140 millimeters. Let's just calculate our net area here now. We might as well. So 343 times 140 equals 48,020 millimeters squared. Let's calculate S. S, we know, is BD squared divided by 6, or 140 times 343 squared divided by 6. I'm going to write this, uh, I'm going to write this in um, scientific notation. 2.75 times 10 to the 6 millimeters cubed. Moment of inertia for a rectangle we know is BD cubed divided by 12, or 140 times 343 cubed divided by 12. Again, another very big number. I'm going to write it in scientific notation we end up with 471 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. And you know what? I'm going to do my depth to width ratio right now, which is 343 to 140, which is the same thing as 343 divided by 140 2.45 to 1. So it looks like we're not going to have any buckling issues on this. So let's start taking a look at our factors now. Let's go to all of our factors. Well, there's nothing saying it's anything but standard term load duration factor, so 1. It doesn't say that it's a joist or a stud, which is our first, first hint that no way could it be part of the system, which means our KH is going to be 1. Service condition. Now this is outside. It's an outside service condition. So 
dry, they're all one, but a wet service condition um, for something with 89 millimeters or less, well, we're not. Our smallest dimension is 140. So smallest dimension over 89, bending is one. Shear is one, and modulus of elasticity is one. So even though it's outside, it's saying this thing is big enough that they don't think it would reduce, it would lose any strength by being wet. It would just be so robust that we're not going to have that problem. Uh, treatment factor, they didn't say anything about it being treated. It's Douglas fir outside, but it's untreated. So wet service condition of one. Um, we have size factor that we need to look, look up. Um, larger dimension, we have 343, so way down here. And our smaller dimension is 114 or more. So we have 140. So it looks like our size factor is one. That was all but our KL factor which we calculated our depth to width ratio to be 2.45 to one, or less than four to one, which means our KL can be one. That seems like all of our factors that we needed to calculate. Let's write those all down. On the screen. So let's write all of those down. We have KD equals one. KH for bending and KH for shear both equaled one. It wasn't part of a system. Our load duration was normal and it wasn't part of a system. Our service condition factors, even though this was outside, they said this was robust enough that they didn't think there'd be any loss in strength due to it being in a wet service condition. Treatment factor, there was no treatment on it, so our treatment factor is one. Our size factor for both bending and shear was one. And our buckling factor was also one. It was not going to be governed by buckling. This thing was stocky enough that it was not going to be governed by buckling. So the next thing we need to do is calculate our equations. We need to figure out uh, what everything is. So MR, we know, equals the reduction factor for bending times FB times our section modulus, times our size factor for bending, times our uh, buckling factor, essentially. Well, we know all of these except for capital FB. Capital FB uh, equals our lowercase FB, which we looked up, times all of the factors we need to multiply it by, but every single factor we have is one. So we can figure out our moment. It's 0.9 times 15.8 MPA times our section modulus of 2.75 times 10 to the 6 times 1 times 1. So 0.9 times 15.8 times 2.75 times 10 to the 6. And we get a really large number in Newton millimeters. I'm going to divide by 1,000 and divide by 1,000. And I get 39.1 kilonewton meters. So I have uh, a moment resistance now. VR, I know, is my reduction factor for shear times my capital stress version for shear times two-thirds times
times my net area times my size factor for shear. Well, my uh, modified stress for shear is 1.5 times 1. All the factors are 1. There was no way to modify this. Every single factor we had was 1. So we have 0.9 times 1.5 MPA times two-thirds times our area, which is 48,020 millimeters squared, times our size factor, which is 1. So we can multiply this out, or 0 0.9 times 1.5 times 2 divided by 3 times 48,020 and we get 43,218. But we want to divide that by 1,000 because that was newtons and we want kilonewtons. And we get 43.2 kilonewtons. So that's the two parts of our strength equation that we need to think about. We also need to think about serviceability. So we know that we have an EI required. And I'm going to I'm going to skip a step here a little bit on us cuz we didn't calculate what the serviceability requirements <coughs> were. You know, check and make sure what was our length here? <coughs> so I'm going to write it in the equation, but we're going to use dead plus live deflection. That's right. Dead plus live deflection allowable of L divided by 240. And I guess it's snow. We're going to use these deflection criteria. I'll go back and write that directly into the equation, into the question for you. So we're coming down here, and we need to figure out our I required. Remember, this is just a way of rewriting the actual or the deflection limits that we have on this. So we know, <clears throat> having done this a few times now, that we're just rearranging our maximum deflection equation that we saw for a uniformly distributed line load, which we know we have. We have a uniformly distributed line load. So if you guys remember, that was deflection equals 5 times WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 EI. We're just rearranging this and bringing EI over here. So we still have 5 times WL to the power of 4 divided by 384 times deflection. But this is our deflection allowable. So, so let's, let's do the, the first one, one of dead plus snow. snow. So, so the EI required to satisfy the dead plus snow requirements is 5 times, and our dead plus snow equation is 5.15 times our length and if you guys remember, this beam was 6 meters long, so 6,000 to the power of 4 divided by 384 times our allowable deflection for dead plus snow, or L, sorry, L divided by 240. So last time we did this, I just worked this out and plugged that number directly in. But you can keep it all uh, in one step if you want. So 5 times 5.15 times 6,000 to the power of 4 divided by 384 times 6,000 divided by 240. <clears throat> and we get... 3.476 times 10 to the 12. Well, remember I said 
the, the wood code often writes this in times 10 to the 9. So this is right. I'm just going to move the decimal place over uh, and change the scientific notation to times 10 to the 9. So 3,476 times 10 to the 9 Newton millimeters squared. So we need a beam with that EI minimum to make sure that we meet this deflection criteria. Remember, we need to make sure it's strong enough and stiff enough. But we have two different deflection criteria that we need to worry about. So we have the other one, which is just snow by itself. So the EI required five times WL4 384 times our allowable deflection. So this will be our uh, line load for just snow and our allowable deflection for just snow. Or five times our equation for snow is 3.25 times 6,000 to the power of 4 divided by 384 times our L, which is 6,000, divided by 360. They gave us the deflection criteria they wanted us to use here. So we can plug this into our calculator. We've got, if you want, I can keep all the brackets nice and handy, 5 times 3.25 times 6,000 to the power of 4, divided by 384 times 6,000 divided by 360. <clears throat> and we get 3.291 3 times 10 to the 12, but I like to write it in times 10 to the 9 because that's how the wood code references EI as well. So we have 3,291 times 10 to the 6 Newton millimeters squared. So it looks like the EI required for us, if we have to make sure that our actual EI is greater than both of these, it means it's got to be greater than that one. And so look, this is our dead snow equation. In our last example we did, live by itself is the one that governed. So it's not clear which criteria is going to govern. You have to go through the steps to figure it out. So we now know that we can start to compare these. Does 140 by 343 Douglas fir number one work? Well, oh, we haven't calculated the actual EI. I did this last time, too. We have to calculate the actual EI, don't we? So let's calculate the ESI actual. Well, we know that that just means that it is E times our KSE times our KZ, I believe, or KT, our treatment factor times our i, where we have an e of 12,000. All of our factors were 1, and our i was 471 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. So our ei actual is 12,000 times 400 471 times 10 to the 6. We get uh, 5.65 times 10 to the 12. We like to write this out in uh, times 10 to the 9, just because that's how the wood code writes it. You, It's nothing wrong with writing it out to the 12. Just try to be consistent so it's easier to see at a glance what's going on. So 5,652 times 10 to the 9 Newton millimeters squared. So now we can see if this works. Does 
140 by 343 Douglas fir number one work. Emma, way up here that we calculated a few weeks ago, is 35 kilonewton meters. <clears throat> VF, we also calculated a few weeks ago, is 23.3 kilonewtons. And EI required, we need an EI of at least 3,476 times 10 to the 9 newton millimeters squared. Let's write out what we've got. MR we calculated to be 39.1 kilonewton meters. VR we've calculated as 43.2 kilonewtons. And EI actual we calculated as 5,652 times 10 to the 9 newton millimeters squared. So let's see. 39.1 is greater than 35. Yes. 43.2 is greater than 23.3. Yes, it is. And 5,652 is greater than 3,476. Both times 10 to the 9. And this is why I like to keep them in the same scientific notation, because you can see at a glance now that it is, in fact, greater. So I put a big box around it and say, yes, it works. So if somebody's looking at my pages of calculations, they can come along and see a summation of exactly what all of this work was about. This is the member we're talking about. Does it work? Yes, and here's why. So those are three worked out examples. The way I've tried to do the assignment for you guys is that you will go through and get points for looking these things up and for looking these things up. And then, yes, there will be some points for the steps, but even though this is the harder calculated work, it's dependent on these things. So if you got a mistake here, you'd make a mistake here. And I don't want to penalize you guys like that. So I've tried to work it that you'd lose very little points for a mistake later on. So I've tried to do it in a way that I think is pretty fair. But we do need some ability to um, ensure the people that are doing it correctly get some sort of compensation. I've just tried to make the disparity not too much. Uh, take your time. Communicate with each other. I don't expect you to work in isolation on this. As much as you are isolated, I expect communication between you guys. You, this isn't a quiz. This isn't an exam. You are allowed to talk to each other about these things. I don't expect you to just look at someone's answers and fill in the, uh, the answers on the assignment because you're not going to learn that way. But feel free to talk to each other. That is a fantastic way to take things in. So here's that all worked out again. Um, just a quick note on that one. If we went to the beam tables, uh, remember that the fact that, that Douglas fir number one was wet gave us zero changes in our factors. Every single factor was one. Look what the beam tables say for that Douglas fir beam. 39, 43.2, 5,650, which is exactly what we calculated. Let's take a look. Let's even open that up. What, why not, right? Um, well, that wasn't smart of me. Let's get rid of that for a second. Uh, let's find where that is. I think it's somewhere up around page 58. No, those are a glue lamb, which we're not... We're not going to do the design on glue lamb. Okay, so here we are. Sawn timbers. We had a 140 by 343. That's what we had, right? 140 by 343 of Douglas fir. So we have... You guys can't see this. <laughs> 
sorry. Here you go. This is what you want to see. All right. So we are in the. Oh, this is red because it's not my. We are Sun Timber one forty. Douglas fir. One forty by three forty three. The mouse doesn't show up very big here. Uh, number one grade for MR and VR. Here's our thirty nine, our forty three point two. And our 5,650, but you can see up above that it's times 10 to the 9. So everything that's in this table is what we've calculated. So you now have the ability to do all of those calculations. So here it is, pulled up again for you. Now I did this last week for the columns. This is what the steel beam that we sized looked like, and this is what the wood beam looked like. So it's bigger. That well, might have an architectural impact. Remember, Remember this, this is the contractor suggesting this as a cost value change. Um, you know, I, this was something I made up. These were rough numbers from a few years ago, just to look at comparisons. Um, so the wood is heavier, but it used to be that wood was cheaper than steel per pound. Um, wood has gone up drastically in the past year. Um, so whether this would actually be a cost savings for the owner, I don't know. But maybe the architect sees it and loves it and says, yes, definitely, we want to go with this wood Douglas fir option. You know, maybe the, the rink interior is all in exposed glue lamp, and this reads similar to that glue lamp scenario. So everybody said, this aesthetic works for us. So we have to know more about the context, which right now isn't what our job is, but it's nice to give them feedback that goes with this. You can't always know why someone's asking the question, but it's good to maybe give them some feedback. I never like to say, no, that's dumb. I like to take a look at it, give them the answers that they're looking for, but then maybe offer a little bit of advice to go with it. Like, yeah, you can do this. Uh, may I ask why? Or it might have this impact on you. Things like that. Uh, this is just a little, I think I've gone over this before for you guys, um, why we call things D versus B. You guys can take a look at this. Um, if we had something bending from, on its weak axes, we might switch around what's D and what's B, but that's not what we're going to worry about right now. So takeaway tips. Uh, you should understand that wood beam design includes lateral compression buckling, even though it tends not to ever govern. You should know how to calculate MR and VR for beams, stringers, and joists. You should know how to calculate EI required for beams. You, you should know, know how to look up MR, VR, and EI for sections. And you should be able to identify if the beam works. You need to be able to do that little summary sheet. I can tell you that even though we're not doing um, uh, a steel, uh, pro or we're not doing a wood project for your, um, your uh, part two. Uh, it, it is steel, but I want to see that summation chart at the end, whether this thing works or not. So that's it. Next week, we're going to jump into composite design, which is really helping us lead into concrete design.